In Taylor Swift's new song, Antihero, there is a line that has caught many people's attention. Sometimes I feel like everybody is a sexy baby, and I'm a monster on the hill. Many have attributed this line in the song as a reference to this clip from 30 Rock. So you can drop the sexy baby act and lose the pigtails. But I like my pigtails. My uncle says they're sexy. Enough with the gross jokes and that voice. I want you to talk in your real voice. This is my real voice. And the whole sexy baby thing isn't an act. I'm a very sexy baby. Though, to quote Sophia June for Nylon Magazine, to pin sexy baby as a 30 Rock reference is embarrassingly naive. The concept of a sexualized child, however uncomfortable, is a part of the bedrock of our culture around sex and desire. It is utterly perplexing to me that people are confused. Pedophilia is far more common than anyone wants to acknowledge, and even if that is uncomfortable, it is inextricably linked with the omnipresent phenomenon of the sexy baby. The idea of a girl or woman who is infantilized and subsequently sexualized either in dress or demeanor. It is present in everything from Victoria's Secret Pink to actresses in pigtails. So today I want to explore how film tropes have in many ways created and exasperated this phenomenon of the sexy baby. I believe the sexy baby trope can be seen and broken down into three different categories of female characters in film. The first is the most obvious, perhaps the oldest of these three categories is the Lolitas in film. These are the stories that sexualize underage girls, such as of course Lolita, Pretty Baby, and American Beauty. The second is the bimbo trope who are, although adults, are depicted speaking in high-pitched, childlike voices and often depicted as dumb or naive. Examples of this trope include most of Marilyn Monroe's roles, Betty Boop, and the character from 30 Rock that we mentioned earlier. The third and last trope is the Born Sexy Yesterday, a term coined by Jonathan McIntosh from Pop Culture Detective here on YouTube. This trope is in many ways a combination of the other two tropes, though is almost exclusively exclusively seen in the sci-fi and fantasy genre. It is when a female character is quite literally very young in age, at times only minutes or even days old, usually within five years of age, or otherwise very naive, but due to being a fantasy creature of some kind is depicted in the body of a fully grown woman. Examples of this trope are Lilu in Fifth Element and Chi in Chobits. These three tropes contribute to the sexy baby phenomenon as they all simultaneously sexualize girlhood while infantilizing womanhood. To quote Dr. Lisa Wade in Power, Mickey Mouse, and the Infantilization of Women, the sexualization of girls and the infantilization of adult women are two sides of the same coin. They both tell us that we should find youth, inexperience, and naivety sexy in women, but not in men. This reinforces a power and status difference between men and women where vulnerability, weakness, and dependency and their opposites are gendered traits. Desirable in one sex, but not in the other. Today, I will be discussing all three of these tropes, their conception and the way they perpetuate the simultaneous sexualization and infantilization of real life women and girls and the harm this causes. It is important to note that when I am speaking about the Lolita, the Bimbo, and the Born Sexy Yesterday, I am not speaking about real life women, but rather the archetype of the sexy baby perceived through the lens of the male gaze and projected onto women and girls, real or fictionalized. Part 1. The Lolita in Film and the Sexualization of Girls Lolita is an English language term defining a young girl as precariously seductive. It originates from Vladimir Nabokov's 1955 novel Lolita, which portrays the narrator Humbert's sexual obsession with and victimization of a 12-year-old girl whom he privately calls Lolita, the Spanish nickname for her given name Dolores. Unlike Novikov, however, contemporary writers typically use the term Lolita 
to portray a young girl who attracts adult desire as complicit rather than victimized. So when I am discussing Lolitas in film, I am discussing underage girls in film that are sexualized for the sake of the male gaze. Part 1, Chapter 1, Shirley Temple. The sexualization of minors in film has existed for as long as the film industry has. As early as the 1930s, children were being sexualized for the pleasure of adult audiences. Baby burlesque was a popular genre of film during this time and is the genre in which Shirley Temple rose to fame. In Temple's own autobiography, she describes them as a cynical exploitation of our childish innocence and occasionally were sexist and racist. War Babies, released in 1932, was an example of this genre. The film depicted toddlers playing GIs in a French watering hole, drinking bottles of milk in place of beer, exchanging large lollipops as currency, and engaging in a dumbed-down menage a trois with Shirley Temple playing a prostitute character. Ara Osterweil's 2009 article in Camera Obscura argues that Temple's films use a pet gaze. The displacement of adult sexuality onto the body of a child involved an industry-wide fetishization in which Temple's infantile sexuality was both deliberately marketed and scrupulously preserved. It is clear that Temple's innocence and the signature shots of her underpants were crucial to her erotic appeal. Temple wrote in her autobiography that on her first visit to MGM Studios, she had a meeting with one of the studio's producers, Arthur Freed. During this private meeting, Freed unzipped his pants and exposed himself to 12-year-old Temple before saying, I have something just for you. Shirley responded in a fit of nervous giggles and Arthur Freed promptly threw her out of his office, embarrassed. It is a well-known fact that since Hollywood's conception, young women and girls have been forced into sexually exploitative and manipulative situations. So it should come as no shock that these men would not be making morally righteous films. This was not the last time Shirley faced this type of issue behind closed doors. At the age of 17, she had a meeting with David O. Selznick, producer of Gone with the Wind. Selznick's creative director at the time, Anita Colby, warned Shirley to be careful if she found him in stockings. Temple writes in her autobiography that this gave her the impression that sex could be a condition for employment with Selznick. Coming around my side of the desk, he reached and took my hand in his. Glancing down, I saw the telltale stocking feet. Pulling free, I turned for the door, but even more quickly, he reached back over the edge of his desk and flicked a switch I had learned from Colby was a remote door-locking device. I was trapped. Like the cartoon of a wolf and a piglet, once again, we circled and reversed directions around his furniture. Blessed with the agility of a young dancer and confronted by an amorous but overweight producer, I had little difficulty avoiding passionate clumsiness, Shirley Temple reflects in her autobiography. A 2007 study from the American Psychological Association claims media that sexualizes children and teens by appearance may serve to normalize abusive practices such as child abuse, child prostitution, and the sexual trafficking of children. This statement is true both culturally and within the lives of the girls who are sexualized on screen. Throughout the entirety of Temple's childhood and adolescence, she was forced to fight off sexual predators as she was frequently groped, threatened, and terrorized by men who felt entitled to her body. Shirley once again reflects in her book on another occasion in which she was alone with a producer, and after she denied his sexual advances, he stated, Look, I'm going to be a big executive. We're going to have to get along. What I had in mind was just a workplace formality. It may be in your contract, but not mine, Shirley replied. Sex is like a glass of water, the man she simply refers to as the wizard continued. You get thirsty, you drink. You want to have sex, you have it. On another occasion, George Jessel invited Temple to his office, stating he wanted to discuss a role in his upcoming film with her. Shirley once again reflects on the assault in her autobiography. We were standing a pace apart, eyeball to eyeball. In one swift movement, he opened his trousers and with a sudden reach encircled me with one arm. I could feel his other hand groping to lift my shirt. Hard on the heels of the wizard, this new assault seemed unreal, but little could I do but thrust my right knee upward into his groin. 
Pain, disgust, and hate flickered across his face, but I felt no mercy. More and more, the adult movie business seemed populated with a bunch of copulating tomcats. After so many incidents such as these described by Temple, it is no surprise that she opted out of the film industry at only 22. No longer wishing to be subjected to such abuse, but it is important to keep in mind that at the time of these events, Shirley was one of the biggest and most beloved stars in the world. Between 1935 and 1938, Temple was the world's top box office star, beating out the likes of Clark Gable. If the producers felt as though they could subject someone with the star power of Shirley Temple to such abuse, I am fearful to imagine the abuse that lower-ranking starlets were subjected to during this time. I imagine Temple's star power was the primary reason as to why she felt she was able to defend herself and rightfully kicking men like George Jessel in the groin. Unfortunately, the 1930s was only the beginning of Hollywood's long-held legacy of exploiting and abusing young girls for the sake of a pedophilic male gaze. Part 1, Chapter 2. Lolita. In September of 1955, what would become one of the world's most famous and culturally influential novels was published and promptly banned in several countries due to its controversial nature. I am of course referring to Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita. Though I will not be speaking so in-depthly on the novel itself, because honestly the novel is not what I have an issue with, and I will actually be contrasting the way in which Nabokov's intentions with his novel Lolita have been completely and repeatedly ignored and corrupted by the men who have adapted his novel into films. In the article The Fetishization of Girlhood by M.C. Easton, Easton states, as a writer, I find it impossible to think about the fetishization of girlhood without referencing Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita. The point of that novel is not that the grown man fetishizes girls. It's that we find it acceptable, even normal, when they do. Nabokov plays a game with the reader to see how far we are willing to tolerate Humbert and whether we see it his way, a grand romance between an older man and a willing nymphette, but Nabokov is testing us. Do we believe Humbert when he assures us that Dolores' cries of no are followed by sighs of pleasure? Do we believe that Humbert's disparaging comments about adult female bodies, polluted, big-bodied creatures, and, glu- go- and goose flesh are enough to justify his kidnapping and rape of a 12-year-old girl? In the films, we lose this nuance. It is evident to me that the men who adapted both versions of this film very much missed the point that Nabokov was attempting to make with his book. Or if they did, they failed to translate it onto screen. James B. Harris was on board as producer, and Stanley Kubrick was hired as the director to adapt the 1962 adaption of Lolita. And at this time, one of the main issues when adapting was navigating around the Production Code of Administration, or PCA, which had strict guidelines in reference to the Hayes Code on what was allowed to be shown on screen. The Hayes Code prohibited profanity, suggestive nudity, graphic or realistic violence, sexual persuasions, and rape, amongst other things. Which, as one could expect, made the adaption of Lolita very challenging. Kubrick and Harris asked Nabokov himself to write the screenplay. Twenty years after the film was released, Nabokov recalled an an amiable battle of suggestion and counter-suggestion on how to cinemize the novel. And the final script was heavily edited by Kubrick. Kubrick's script seemed more concerned with exploring the themes of sexual suppression rather than critiquing the real sexual crimes of the protagonist. And while this is understandable due to the censorship laws, it does beg the question as to why Kubrick bothered to adapt the novel in the first place. One of the early suggestions made to Nabokov when adapting the script was suggesting making one big change to pacify this PCA. Make Humbert and Dolores a married couple. Nabokov hated this concept and actually quit over it, sending a letter to the producer of the film, James B. Harris, deciding against the script job due to frustrating negotiations and the marriage tweak, which was, in Nabokov's own words, a particular stumbling block. Nabokov later returned after Kubrick and Harris dropped the marriage plot entirely. Their new solution was to age 12-year-old Lolita up, and she would instead be 15 years old. Therefore, in order to make a releasable film, Kubrick and Harris were tasked with hiring an actress who appeared older than Dolores Hayes that Nabokov described in his book. Of 800 auditionees, 
14-year-old Sue Leon was, cho- was chosen to play the role. Sue Leon appeared much older than 14, and this was only further emphasized by the way in which she was stylized in the film. In the article, The Troubling Legacy of the Lolita Story 60 Years On, Steph Green states, When watched today, the final film is a bag of contradictions. Leon is made up with eyeliner, sooty lashes, permanently coiffed hair, and yet she sleeps in the nightdress of a Victorian doll. All ruffles, ribbons, and bows. When we first meet her, she is rigidly placed and poised, gazing at Humbert over the top of her sunglasses. She looks imperious, knowing, and appears to be at least 18. She is not, as Nabokov describes in the book, standing four feet tall in one sock. In a 1974 foreword to Lolita, a screenplay, Nabokov admitted that the frills of Miss Leon's elaborate nightgown were painful. Nabokov would also later go on to say that Catherine de Monjou, the scrappy, tomboyish, then 12-year-old of Zazie in the Metro, would have been the ideal Lolita instead. The difference between how Nabokov saw Lolita and how Kubrick and Harris saw Lolita is so jarring, and there really isn't a better example than this uh, to display that the sexualization of Dolores Hayes or Lolita as a character begun with the 1962 adaptation of the novel, not the novel itself. The decision of Kubrick and Harris would once again be echoed years later in the 1997 adaptation where Dominique Swain was cast to play Dolores, though I would say the casting choice in 1997 was more accurate to what Nabokov would have wanted, though the styling choices still reflect a more fetishized version of his protagonist than what he describes in the book, though I will touch more on the 1997 version later. Determined to adapt to this controversial book, despite the strict censorship laws, Kubrick and Harris made an effort to divert focus away from Sulian and thus Lolita's age. Harris disturbingly went on record saying, we knew we must make her a object, where everyone in the audience could understand why everyone would want to jump on her. And in a 2015 interview, Harris once again affirmed his opinion by saying, we made sure when we cast her that she was a definite sex object, not something that could be interpreted as being perverted. We wanted it to come off as a love story and to feel very sympathetic with Humbert. This statement goes directly against what Nabokov intended for his book. Nabokov makes a point in describing how small Dolores Hayes is. At the age of 12, she is four foot 10 and weighing only 90 pounds. He emphasizes her childlike stature and based on what Catherine de Monjou looks like, uh, whom Nabokov thought bore the most resemblance to Dolores, she is very much supposed to look like a child because that's what she is, a child. However, Harris states that we made sure when we cast her, she was a definite object in reference to a 14 year old is deeply problematic referring to any woman or girl as a sex object is obviously not okay but especially when they're a minor film critic daniel de wrote in 1974 though 14 during filming leon appears to be a well-developed 17 and humbert's desire for her comes off as ordinary lust statements like this imply that as long as a young girl appears older than she is that a man's lust for her is justified this also applies that a 37-year-old Humbert lusting after a 17-year-old girl would be ordinary and somehow ethical. In The Troubling Legacy of the Lolita Story, 60 Years On, Steph Green states, By making this version of Dolores a worldly participant, Kubrick's adaptation sets off a domino effect that continues to poison pop culture to this day. In 1992, Ellen Von Unworth shot Kate Moss for Glamour Italia in a cover and spread titled Charming Lolita. In these photos, 18-year-old Moss is styled with a red lollipop, a doll, and ringlet curls. Years later, John Galliano had selected the 15-year-old to open his show as his Lolita, launching her career as a forever young waif. This alone reflects how the word has become a stand-in for a young girl who is a quote-unquote willing participant in her own premature sexualization. It's fair to say that Lolita walked so that Alicia Silverstone's sexually aggressive 14-year-old Adrian in The Crush could run. This film in many ways contributes to the sexualization of minors both on and off the screen. In many ways, Sue Leon's real life began to mirror the horror story that the character Lolita endured. 
In Lights, Camera, Child Abuse, The Toleration of Child Sexualization in Hollywood and the Implications of Abuse for Minority Girls, Gina Sanchez states, For some producers and directors, Hollywood is a space for them to personally carry out their own perverse agendas. Hollywood gives accused pedophiles like Woody Allen acceptable places for them to interact with children and bring their perverse fantasies to fruition. In Manhattan, Woody Allen not only directed a movie about a relationship between an older man and a 17-year-old girl, but he cast himself to play the older man, giving him a socially acceptable platform to engage in a taboo relationship with a young girl. As we discussed, this occurred with Shirley Temple, it occurred with Sue Leon whilst filming Lolita, and it is a common thread amongst most of the young starlets discussed today. Very jarring parallels to the source novel quickly began to arise in Leon's life. Leon's daughter, Nona Harrison Gomez, explains that the reputation of Lolita negatively impacted her mother's career. She was so much stronger than this twisted, complicated interpretation of what a girl or a woman is. They had in her contract that she was supposed to do something like five or six movies after Lolita, and instead she had to keep promoting Lolita for years afterwards. That movie pigeonholed her in a way that didn't allow her to move forward with her career. Sue Leon became relatively withdrawn from speaking to the press, giving a rare statement in 1996 that highlighted the impact that Lolita had had on her life. My destruction as a person dates from that movie. I despise any pretty girl who is rocketed to stardom at 14 in a sex nymphette role to stay on a level path thereafter. Leon was 14 when she was cast in the film and spent several months in 1960 and 1961 on, on the film set in London. According to Leon's friend Michelle Phillips, it was on that set that Leon began a relationship with producer James B. Harris. After filming had wrapped, Michelle Phillips was able to reunite with Sue Leon and in her own words, found her friend completely changed. Then Leon revealed her secret. She had lost her virginity to James B. Harris. Phillips was shocked, stating, I saw a picture of him. He looked like her grandfather. At the time, Leon would have been 14 years old to James B. Harris's 32 years old. The age of consent in England where they were filming was 16 at the time and 18 in California. Harris and Leon never married and it is unclear how long they were seeing each other and what the nature of their relationship exactly was to Harris beyond the exploitation of Leon's youth and naivety. Only a few years later, Sue Leon got married to screenwriter Hampton Fancher, a man eight years her senior. They were married when Sue Leon was 17 and Fancher was 25. It was Fancher's second marriage. Please note that Hampton Fancher is the screenwriter for the Blade Runner series, which we will be talking about later on, and his marriage to the real-life Lolita makes talking about his content a little bit more interesting. Michelle Phillips further reflected on Sue Leon's legacy. She was lost in her life, and who could blame her? The life she had lived would lead her into this unfortunate place in her mind, where she really didn't think much of herself. To quote Sarah Weinman in her essay, The Dark Side of Lolita, Lolita made Leon a star. It was also the beginning of an undoing similar to the one of Nabokov's Nymphet Endures. Her future included decades of mental instability, five marriages, a child she would end up abandoning, and protracted physical decline culminating in her death at 73 in 2019. Though Leon credited her early stardom for her own destruction, it's long been rumored that what occurred during filming and what broke her was a sexual relationship with the film's producer, James B. Harris. And as if the 1962 adaptation wasn't enough, <laughs> Hollywood just couldn't stop itself from once again attempting to translate Novikov's novel onto film. Of course, once again, upon the release, it was met with controversy. Many hated it, many loved it, and still today, many love this film, and many people hate this film. In his essay, New Lolita Does Terrible Disservice to Nabokov and Our Children, Paul Marr accurately has this to say about the 1997 adaptation of Lolita. The film is troubling, not because a director decided to make another film from Nabokov's dark novel, but because this version strays from the book in substantive ways. Nabokov's novel, although not on our family bookshelf, treated the story of a predatory file with grim reality, portraying Humbert as a sick monster preying on the vulnerable 12-year-old Lolita, 
who has become his stepdaughter. But the director, Lynn, changes Nabokov's basic story by making Humbert a troubled but sympathetic figure who unsuccessfully battles forbidden desires and ultimately yields the aggressive advances of Lolita, whom Lynn depicts as a 14-year-old seductress. This not only strays wildly from the book's portrayal, but it casts pedophilia and incest in a totally different light. The child is a willing, even aggressive participant, and the as a passive and sympathetic victim. The film's screenwriter Stephen Schiff responded to criticism and said that the movie's critics in America come from a very jumpy, keep it in the dark, maybe it will go away kind of culture and ensured that the film won't encourage pedophilia because Humbert comes to an awful end and that if you make a film about a murderer, you're not advocating for murder. Comments like these from the men who adapted both versions of the film are terribly frustrating, and as I struggle to find the words to refute this horrible statement made by Schiff, I must merely quote Paul Murr again. <laughs> it is comments like these that demonstrate the ignorance of Lolita's defenders concerning the horrors of pet and the impact of film on behavior. The problem with the new Lolita is not that it brings pet to light, but that by changing the title character from a victimized little girl to a sexually aware and aggressive young woman beyond her years, the predator becomes a victim and the film provides solace, even inspiration, to those for whom young girls are objects of sexual desire. After spending $58 million to bring this film onto screen, the filmmakers and now their distribution partners are trying very hard to convince us it's okay. It's not. A film about a grown man having sex with his young stepdaughter is repulsive. By trying to capitalize on a film that will ultimately endanger our young people, Showtime is not displaying the artistic bravery, but pure corporate greed. In addition to what Mara said, Schiff is being completely ignorant in his interpretation of the film is okay because Humbert comes to an awful end, as if the main concern from our society on men who prey on underage girls should be having sympathy for the men's demise rather than the lasting psychological impacts that sexual abuse and assault has on literal children. In The Fetishization of Girlhood, M.C. Easton states, men who prey on young women, it's not an accident or instinct. It's a sexual predator seeking an opportunity and choosing to take it with both hands. Humbert's disgust with adult women and his preference for children echoes the sentiments of many men online today. From the popularity of barely legal porn to the Twitter trolls who try to body shame women into silence, Humbert Humbert is very much alive and well in today's America. Part 1, Chapter 3 Brooke Shields. Actress and model Brooke Shields has been sexualized throughout her childhood and adolescence, both on and off the screen. Brooke began modeling as early as 11 months old, and when she was only 10 years old, she was published fully nude in Playboy. Yes, you heard that correctly. Brooke was 10 when photographer Gary Gross took photos of her posing nude in a bathtub in 1975. It has been stated that the photos were not intended to be pornographic in nature, but I find that hard to believe. Brooke's mother, Terry Shields, was on set with Brooke that day and consented on behalf of her daughter. Terry expresses that she had intentions for Brooke to enter show business just five days after Brooke was born, stating, She's the most beautiful child and I'm going to help with her career. It seems Terry's dreams of her daughter provoked her to agree to this photo shoot, which saw Brooke fully nude, wearing heavy eye makeup, lipstick, and covered in oil. The 10-year-old was directed to sit in a bathtub with two of the published images showing Brooke full frontal and completely exposed. Photographer Gross stated that the images were not meant to be pornographic, but did say that Brooke was supposed to look like a sexy woman. Some of the things that these men who work on these projects say just completely baffle me. You should never say that your intention when photographing a 10-year-old is to have them look like a sexy woman, let alone when they are being photographed nude. In 1986, a Senate committee report claimed that a pedophile needs to know or to convince himself that his obsession is not abnormal and dirty. It is shared by thousands of other intelligent and sensitive people. 
This is exactly what the sexualization of children in Hollywood does. As we saw with the producers of The Baby Burlesque, as we saw with James B. Harris while working on Lolita 1962, and screenwriter Stephen Schiff while working on Lolita 1997, and we see once again with this photographer while photographing literal child pornography, these men who work on these projects are desperately trying to convince us that what they are doing is morally okay when it is not. I urge you to keep the Senate committee report in mind as we move forward because it is vital in the conversation surrounding the normalization of the sexualization of children in our media. The issue of the magazine that Brooke appeared in reportedly also contained three other pages featuring photos of what were referred to as nymphettes on the page. This term is of course referring back to none other than Lolita and it is unclear how old the girls in these photos were. Brooke had her feature film debut at the age of 12, starring as a child prostitute in the 1978 film Pretty Baby. The film was released to a lot of criticism and controversy due to its depictions of child prostitution and the nude scene of Brooke Shields. Despite criticism, Brooke stands behind the film Pretty Baby and has fond memories of being on set. Though asked if she would let her own daughter star in such a movie, Shields said, being a mom now, looking at my 11-year-old daughter, I would not facilitate it. Shields would then go on to star in Blue Lagoon, another controversial film for its sexualization of underage book shields. The film tells the story of two young children stranded alone on a tropical island, but without either the guidance or restriction of society, emotional and physical changes arise as they reach puberty and fall in love. Brooke was 14 at the time of filming, Though most of her nude scenes were performed by a body double, it still creates a sexual fantasy in the minds of the viewers in which they are sexualizing a 14-year-old girl. Body double or not, I can't help but once again question the urge for grown men to write and direct a story about 14-year-olds discovering their sexuality in a fantasized and sexualized manner. Also, because of the roles that Brooke played, Interviewers often felt it was okay to ask Brooke inappropriate questions about her personal life. Is Brooke Shields at age 16 or even at when you were 15? 16 and two days. 16 and two days. Yeah. Is, is Brooke Shields, uh, could Brooke Shields handle a sexual relationship? I don't think so. I don't, first of all, I don't, that's not what I believe in as far as my own self. I, believe, I would like to wait till I get married. And that's something I've always believed I might change my mind if and when I fall in love, which I haven't yet. But um, I don't think I'm ready at all. I'm not. See, I'm not even ready for something that's smaller than that, that's minor. With just because it's all starting for me now, and I'm. It's everything is so confusing and so crucial at this moment anyway that I just have to worry about my own other problems. <laughs> Are you? Are, you, are your decisions about this book based on your religious background? You're Catholic, aren't you? I'm Catholic. That It doesn't really... It's basically my own personal feelings. Um, I think maybe that the religion could have initiated something, but it's now really up to my own feelings myself. I mean, I, do, I am Catholic, and I do go to church, and, and I'm practicing Catholic, but it doesn't... They really are almost... You know, different. You don't feel there's a conflict between your Catholicism and playing this kind of role? Not at all, because see, there's a. I believe it myself, and I know that whatever I truly believe myself, it really can't be all that wrong if I truly believe in it and trust it. I adore Brooke Shields, and I am so glad that she has been able to live a relatively normal and successful life in spite of the circumstances that she was thrust into as a child. Part 1, Chapter 4, American Beauty. American Beauty is a 1999 American black comedy drama film written by Alan Ball and directed by Sam Mendes in his directorial debut. Following Lester Berman, a depressed suburban father in a midlife crisis decides to turn his hectic life around after developing an infatuation with his daughter's 16-year-old friend. Upon American Beauty's release in 1999, it was praised as the best film of 1999. It received an overwhelming amount of praise, winning a wide array of prestigious awards, including two Academy Awards, one for Best Picture. However, since its release, 
This film is also a movie that has been notably said to have aged poorly, perhaps mostly due to its controversy surrounding Kevin Spacey, as he has been charged for an alarming amount of sexual misconduct towards young men and boys, including 15 men who came forward between 2017 and 2020, highlighting the sexual abuse they experienced from Kevin Spacey, most of whom were underage at the time, and most recently has been charged for seven more cases of sexual assault this month in the UK. I don't know if this is a controversial opinion at this point, but I personally hated this film from the moment I saw it. I'm not sure if it's because I was 17 the first time I watched it and didn't understand the more nuanced subject matter, or if I just felt rightfully entirely bored and uncomfortable with the subject matter and the way in which this girl my own age was being portrayed and sexualized. But in this essay, the author states, the other aspect of this film that was always questionably dealt with but has only gotten worse with time is its portrayal of sexual abuse. Angela Hayes is portrayed as a confident, sexually liberated, and in control, but wider society now has a more nuanced understanding of the facets of sexual abuse. It's now clear that although she presents herself as in control of her sexuality and is many times the one pursuing Lester, the power dynamics of a relationship between a 16-year-old and a 40-something means she is vulnerable and being taken advantage of. Towards the end, as Lester and Angela are about to have sex, and Lester is about to commit statutory rape with a kiss that MTV viewers in 1999 voted for best kiss, Angela admits that she is a virgin, and Lester suddenly sees her as the child that she is. This moment entirely focuses on Lester and his paternal epiphany about his daughter Jane. Angela is discarded, just used as a vehicle for his midlife crisis at the end of the film and his realization at the end. She is barely a character, just a projection. Where have we seen this before? Oh right, both the film adaptations of Lolita took this approach against the wishes of Nabokov in order to justify the inappropriate lust a grown man has towards an underage girl. This trope of the teen girl being the aggressor towards an older man is repeatedly used within cinema as a way to normalize pedophilic tendencies, and it works. To again quote re-watching American Beauty in 2020 as bad as it ever was, the script isn't strong enough to craft a multifaceted and conflicted man. He is an American man at the turn of the century who is taking back control of his life and his masculinity at the expense of his horrible wife and terrible daughter. Lester is afforded the sympathy that many of the other characters, especially the women, aren't given an, even an ounce of, and he dies a hero. After he turned down the teenager, he spent the whole film lusting after because she's a virgin. In a moment of supposed enlightenment, he's the victim that we pity, and dies while finally realizing the beauty of his mundane life and after ruining the lives of the women around him. He's the straight, middle-aged, middle-class man who is the only one whose anger and disillusionment is ever explained or justified. And likewise, how we rarely focus on the emotions of the teens in these films who are victimized by the older men in their lives, we rarely focus on how playing these roles impacts the real life of young women who portray these sexualized characters. Unlike the previous films mentioned, the actress who played Angela, Mina Suvari, was at least above the age of 18 when she filmed American Beauty, though that doesn't mean the role and roles like this didn't have real life impacts on Suvari's life. Suvari has come out and expressed how, for much of her life, she believed her worth was not just in what she looked like, but how sexy she was. The film roles that thrusted her into stardom, such as Heather in American Pie and Angela in American Beauty, firmly positioned her as a fetishized teenage girl, though her brutal sexualization had begun far earlier when she herself was only a minor. Suvari began modeling at the age of 12 and she found that modeling and acting gave her a way to express her feelings, though they also instilled in her from a very young age that the only thing that mattered was the way she looked, and to look sexy was even better. Suvari reflects on her first photo shoot as a 12-year-old girl. Everyone was raving about how I looked 18, but I was 12. What was communicated to me was that I was an adult, therefore I can act like an adult. 
This once again tragically reminds me of Lolita and emphasizes the problem in the way that the 1962 adaptation was casted and stylized. James B. Harris stating that casting a 14-year-old who looked 17 to play Lolita made the entire film seem okay and non-perverse teaches a very dangerous lesson to men that if a young girl seems older or looks older than her age that this is somehow ethical to pursue her. This photo shoot was the beginning of a pattern of older men being attracted to Savari, and she expresses that she felt these older men used her. She remembers one photographer in his 20s who photographed Savari nude alone at his home when she was only 15 years old, and one of her business advisors in his mid-30s who started having sex with her when she was only 16. Savari expressed that I didn't have anyone telling me, that's not right, that person shouldn't be doing that to you. Savari was smart and had good grades. She was going to auditions, and so from an outside perspective, nothing seemed wrong. So to my own detriment, no one noticed, Savari reflected. When reflecting on her time shooting American Beauty, Savari says, I identified with Angela. I knew how to play that role because I was schooled in it. Oh, you want me to be sexually attractive? Done. I felt unavailable in a million other ways, but I knew how to play that card. After American Beauty, despite the widespread success of the film and BAFTA nomination, Suvari still didn't have much power. On one shoot for a magazine, Suvari recalled being encouraged to take her clothes off and only have a medallion around her hips covering her pubic area. While shooting, the photographer asked her to move her hair out of the way to showcase her breast. That it was just another moment where me as a young woman ended up in a room with a man older than me in a situation like that, it's somewhat intimate um, situation. And that was okay with me. That was just commonplace. That was just understood. But it's interesting to me why I thought nothing of that. So I'm trying to create a conversation around that whether it was a person who happens to be named Kevin Spacey or the man who was 26 years old at the Oakwood who took me into his apartment and I'm in my bathing suit and like I was 15. And he's laying with me in just the same way. Now 42, Savari reflects, I just don't know what the goal of that is. Just to sell as much of yourself as young as you are for as long as you can. I don't know what that message is, but yeah, it felt very much like that. How sexy can you be? After American Beauty, Savari went on to make Sugar and Spice, a teen comedy film. While shooting, she entered a relationship with the film's director of photography, Robert Brinkman, a man 16 years older than her. They were quickly married, and Savari said this about the relationship. I was desperately trying to check the boxes on, like what an adult does. Maybe I was looking for a family. I can't help but feel reminded of Sulian and the real life impacts that playing Lolita had on her. What needs to be emphasized is that these aren't just characters of young girls being fetishized. By choosing to tell these stories through the medium of film, the grown men involved in these projects are subjecting real life young women and girls to this fetishization, and this has real life consequences. Part one, chapter five, Euphoria. Ah, yes. Sam Levinson, you are not getting away without your name being mentioned. There have been many, many video essays on euphoria and why it is or isn't problematic in its depiction of teens. So I'm gonna try not to linger on euphoria for too long, but I did feel it was necessary to include euphoria in this discussion as it is a modern and in some ways unique example of the fetishization of young girls. Most of the controversy surrounding euphoria is its depictions of drug use and sex and whether or not the show romanticizes these toxic behaviors rather than leveraging its platform Form to have a productive conversation surrounding these things. In the essay, Euphoria still has an over-sexualization problem. Angela Aduo stated, yes, teenagers have sex. This isn't the problem. The problem is the extent to which it is shown on screen and whether it is necessary to the plot. On one hand, it can be reassuring for young people to know that is normal and nothing to be ashamed of. On the other hand, there's a problem with the sensual, choreographed, highly sensationalized depiction of sex that they're showing on screen. 
Some have also pointed out that Euphoria is problematic in its portrayal of teenagers because it opts to have actors who are in their 20s play teens rather than cast actual teenagers. Some have said this contributes to teens having a disjointed perception of adolescence and what they themselves should look like as teens, and I actually kind of disagree with this. I've seen this statement thrown around a lot that teens should be played by teens, and it's a viewpoint I can't fully get on board with. I think the less teens, I think that the less teens are subjected to being in the eye of the media, the better. In all honesty, for the reasons we saw with the actresses mentioned above, amongst others, and I think in many circumstances, teens should be played by adults. Not always, but a lot of the time. <laughs> Though what I don't think is appropriate is when people like Sam Levinson leverage the use of adult actors and teen roles as a way to facilitate hypersexualized and fetishized scenarios about teenagers. This is further highlighted in the essay, Why Does Euphoria Insist on Sexualizing Teenage Girls? To acknowledge that teen girls are sexual people is not a bad thing, but to cater to the very gaze that has in the popular culture made them out to be far older, more mature, and therefore fair game for sexual attention from everyone is another thing entirely. The fact that the show often relies on getting a free pass to do this based on the technical fact that the actors are adults is akin to how some corners of the world waited with bated breath for the moment Billie Eilish turned 18 in order to openly sexualize and project their fantasies onto her. It isn't that there's something icky about looking at teen girls, even if they are played by adult actors being sexual per se, it's about looking at them being sexualized because this means that some someone is doing the sexualizing, and that someone in this instant, it isn't just Nate, it's everyone who watches. It is, for one, a great disservice to the inner world of teen girls, their complexity, richness, and the parts of their humanity that are expressed through their sexuality. It reduces them to a Lolita-esque prop who cannot be described beyond taste adjectives such as yummy, delicious, juicy, or something just as gross. Sam Levinson is very far removed from the psyche of your average teen girl, and this is repeatedly displayed in his lack of awareness of how the lives of teen girls are. In season one, Kat, played by Barbie Ferreira, has this subplot which she becomes a cam girl. In the show, this is depicted as an empowering move to reclaim her body and combat body image issues through her sexuality. Kat is paid to be a sort of online dominatrix to adult men on a website similar to Cornhub or OnlyFans <laughs> in an attempt to harness some sort of pro-sex body image inclusive narrative. Sam Levinson completely ignores that this is utterly illegal and disgusting. Kat is no older than 15 or 16 years of age and to glamorize an underage girl doing sex work to reclaim her body is disturbing and highlights how clueless Sam Levinson is in relation to the psyche of your average teen girl. Because of course he is. He's a grown man and a nepotism baby. It likewise doesn't help that Drake is an executive producer of the show as he has been recorded of being a teen sexualizer. An interesting observation that can be made about Euphoria is the way in which Sam Levinson chooses to depict male versus female sexuality through the perspective of gays. When Nate is having a sexual fantasy about Cassie, we largely see the fantasy through the eyes of Nate. The camera pans Cassie's body in a stylized and sensual way, ensuring to include as many shots of Cassie's breath as Sam Levinson can. We see the fantasy as if we are Nate, though when Kat had a sexual fantasy, we don't see the fantasy through her eyes. To again cite why does Euphoria insist on sexualizing teen girls, we don't see this through her own eyes. We see it from a voyeuristic camera angle, far away from her and barely in her line of sight, as the Viking has aggressive sex with her, almost as if we are peeping into her fantasy, but we're an active part of Nate's. Why? Because of course, Sam Levinson writes from the perspective of the male gaze. Now, I'm not accusing Sam Levinson of anything other than being a bad writer, but I can't help but be uncomfortable with the idea of a grown man being so insistent on spending hours and hours writing a show that includes countless numbers of in-depth, fantasized sex scenes featuring teenage girls. I have to question why. What is your motivation? Why would a grown man be so adamant about spending so much time facilitating these sex 
scenes of teenage girls, if not to fulfill a sort of fantasy of his own. I think it is important to bring up the fact that Sydney Sweeney has mentioned that she had to speak to Sam Levinson about the amount of nude scenes she was written into. In an interview with The Independent, Sydney Sweeney stated that there are moments where Cassie was supposed to be shirtless and I would tell Sam, I don't really think that's necessary here. And although she highlighted that when she spoke to Sam Levinson about these scenes, in which she didn't feel necessary for her to be nude or topless, Levinson was very receptive and he rewrote them immediately. It just begs the skepticism on his intentions with his portrayal of teen girls. And I once again don't believe it is inherently problematic to explore the sexuality or struggles of teens in film. I think it is a necessary part of storytelling. A film I believe does this very well is Mysterious Skin by Greg Araki. Araki manages to explore very dark subject matter, including in a way that never sexualizes the teen and child actors within the film, displaying that it is very possible to represent these concepts in a way that doesn't feel fetishized. Levinson just doesn't want to. Part 1, Chapter 6. Countdown Clocks and Parasocial Grooming. So we have discussed the sexualization of fictional teen characters in film and how this has, in many cases, had very jarring and real-life impacts on the young women and girls who play these characters. But what about the girls who are thrusted into stardom and are not playing roles that are inherently sexualized? In the irony of everything seemingly relating back to Lolita since its conception, Natalie Portman was actually offered the role of Lolita in the 1997 adaptation, though turned the role down due to the fear of being sexualized. Portman has discussed how, as a young starlet, she made every effort to desexualize her image in order to feel safe, and from a young age deduced that the only way she could feel even moderately safe while in the eyes of the media was to hide behind prudish roles. Natalie Portman has publicly spoken about the sexual terrorism she experienced as a young teenager since her debut in Leon the Professional at the age of 12. Portman has expressed how the media's treatment of her impacted her negatively. Let me tell you about my own experience. I turned 12 on the set of my first film, The Professional, in which I played a young girl who befriends a hitman and hopes to avenge the murder of her family. The character is simultaneously discovering and developing her womanhood, her voice, and her desire. At that moment in my life, I too was discovering my own womanhood, my own desire, and my own voice. I was so excited at 13 when the film was released and my work and my art would have a human response. I excitedly opened my first fan mail to read a rape fantasy that a man had written me. A countdown was started on my local radio show to my 18th birthday, euphemistically the date that I would be legal to sleep with. Movie reviewers talked about my budding breasts in reviews. I understood very quickly, even as a 13-year-old, that if I were to express myself sexually, I would feel unsafe, and that men would feel entitled to discuss and objectify my body to my great discomfort. So I quickly adjusted my behavior. I rejected any role that even had a kissing scene and talked about that choice deliberately in interviews. I emphasized how bookish I was and how serious I was and I cultivated an elegant way of dressing. I built a reputation for basically being br prudish, conservative, nerdy, serious in an attempt to feel that my body was safe and that my voice would be listened to. At 13 years old, the message from our culture was clear to me. I felt the need to cover my body and to inhibit my expression and my work in order to send my own message to the world that I'm someone worthy of safety and respect. The response to my expression, from small comments about my body to more threatening deliberate statements, served to control my behavior through an environment of sexual terrorism. Unfortunately, Portman is not the only young starlet to have received this sexualization. There are many other young starlets who have had countdown clocks on online forums where adults play a waiting game counting down the days in which they can legally sexualize a child. This is extremely disgusting and uncomfortable, yet it has become socially acceptable for years. 
In 2004, before the Olsen twins turned 18, several websites had active countdown clocks counting down the minutes where Mary-Kate and Ashley Olsen would become legal. Only a few years later, tabloids were eagerly awaiting the birthday of Harry Potter star Emma Watson to be legal for sexualization as well. Even just a couple years ago, Billie Eilish received similar treatment on her 18th birthday when the internet was flooded with tweets and memes from men excited that they can now legally sexualize her. And just this year, there was a countdown on Reddit for when Stranger Things actress Millie Bobby Brown would turn 18. The countdown was created on a subreddit titled NSFW Millie Bobby Brown and had thousands of members just waiting for the moment they could sexualize the teenage starlet. In their essay, We Need to Talk About the Celebrity 18th Birthday Countdown Clocks, Simone Hanna expresses, we should be protecting young people, not awaiting the moment we can sexualize them. With those in media industries being so comfortable sexualizing young girls, the behavior will naturally be viewed as acceptable by members of the public. These women don't even have the option to choose how people view them. Without any say, many of them are simply stuck on calendars for men old enough to be their fathers, waiting to sexualize them legally. It is important to note that it isn't just grown men eerily waiting for the second they can legally sexualize a teenager. It's that in many cases, these grown men have watched these women grow up, especially in the case of the Olsen twins who were in the spotlight since they were literal babies. This to me makes the culture around countdown clocks feel like a sort of parasocial grooming. The reality is that the media in which we discussed contributes to the societal norm that it is only natural to sexualize underage girls. To eagerly await the day that these girls turn 18 so they will finally be legal for the praying eyes of grown men to pounce. And I feel the need to point out that legal does not mean ethical. The fact that men await eagerly for the second a girl turns 18 is disturbing. I worked in the modeling industry since I was a teenager, and I remember when I turned 18, there was this palpable, predatory vulnerability that I felt. There was a significant shift the moment I turned 18 in the way I was able to navigate the world around me because I was no longer protected by the law from being preyed upon. I would have conversations with photographers and they would encourage me to shoot nude. And when I would insist I didn't want to, the photographers would say that I must not want it enough to be in the industry. Overnight, it went from being illegal for me to be photographed nude to mandatory because I no longer had the law protecting me. And if I refused, well, suddenly I'm a diva and I'm hard to work with. In addition to photographers attempting to persuade me to shoot nude by threatening that if I don't, then I then I don't want it enough. There was also a specific circumstance where I had once again freshly turned 18 and there was this photographer that I was working with in his 40s and he was trying to persuade me to let him shoot me nude. And when I repeatedly said that I didn't want to, I remember one of the things he said to try and persuade me was, well, you might as well do it now because you're in your prime and your body is never gonna look better than it does right now. Which is, such a pro which is such a problematic and jarring thing to hear as a teenager. Yeah, it, it just never sat right with me. This photographer also later went on to sexually assault me. So, I mean, that just kind of shows the type of people that we're talking about here. I also want to mention how prevalent this Lolita concept of sexualizing minors, both on and off the screen, is very palpable within anime. And the Western conditioning of normalizing the fetishization of minors has made the simultaneous objectification of Asian women by white men normalized as well. This has led to many real-life issues of men from the West traveling to countries such as Japan with the intention of sexualizing young women and girls. Mina Lee further explores this concept in her video titled Let's Talk About the Japanese Schoolgirl, which I will have linked below for further viewing. Part two, the bimbo in film and the infantilization of women. Bimbo is a slang term for a conventionally attractive, sexualized, naive, and unintelligent woman. The word bimbo is Italian in origin, literally meaning little child. I do want to make it very clear that when I am discussing the bimbo trope, 
I am not talking about real life women and I am not talking about the modern day like bimbo movement that has been gaining traction in recent years, especially on TikTok. I am speaking only in relation to the cinematic term and trope that has been written by men for men. I also do not mean this term in a derogatory way, nor am I necessarily stating that I do not like the film or the characters that the bimbo trope applies to. Many would assume that the sexy baby trope would end with the Lolita trope. Though I believe the pedophilic gaze manifests onto the minds and bodies of grown women as well. If the Lolita trope, as we discussed, is the sexualization of girls, then the bimbo trope, as we are about to discuss, is the infantilization of women, which are two sides of the sexy baby coin. The 30 Rock clip from earlier actually falls into this category. The bimbo trope is characterized by a woman not only being attractive to men, but also notably by possessing a sort of childlike innocence. A bimbo not only appeals to a man's physical fantasies of a woman, but she also appeals to men in the way that she does not threaten men with her naive and childlike personality. And some films and characters that fall into this category would be Marilyn Monroe's character in The Seven Year Itch, Betty Boop, and Shelley in The House Bunny. In Power, Mickey Mouse, and the Infantilization of Women, Dr. Lisa Wade suggests, what does it mean that feminine beauty is conflated with youthfulness, but masculine beauty is not? That we want women to be both cute and sexual. It means that we feel comfortable with women who seem helpless and require taking care of. Perhaps we even encourage or demand these traits from women. Perhaps these childlike characteristics are most comforting in women who are, in fact, the least needy. I submit that we are more accepting of powerful women when they perform girlish beauty. When they don't, they are often perceived as threatening or unlikable. So yes, the sexualization of girls is interesting, and no doubt, it's no good for girls, and likely contributes to older men's sexual interest in young women. But it's not just about sexualizing kids early. It's about fantasizing adult women too, as a way to remind women of their prescribed social positions relative to men. Part 2, Chapter 1, Betty Boop The infantilized bimbo-esque woman, like the Lolita trope, dates back to the origins of cinema itself. One of the first examples of this, in my opinion, would be Betty Boop. Though one could argue that Betty Boop actually falls into the Lolita category, as Max Flusher, the creator of Betty Boop, stated in a 1932 interview that she was intended to be 16 years old, though this was at the very beginning of Betty Boop's creation, and it is unclear if she remained 16 through the entirety of her cinematic portrayals or if she was aged up later on. I also believe that there's a gray area. A lot of these, these three tropes that we're discussing can kind of bleed into one another. So it is very possible that Betty Boop could be both a, you know, bimbo trope character and a Lolita character. Betty Boop is widely regarded as one of the first sex symbols on the animated screen. She was unique from the other female characters of the time, such as Minnie Mouse, because she was portrayed as a sexual woman. Many female characters of the time were simply copy and pasted versions of their male counterparts, but with a skirt and eyelashes slapped on. Betty Boop, however, stood out as uniquely seductive as she wore short dresses, high heels, a garter, and her breasts were highlighted with a low contoured bodice that showed cleavage. Though in addition to her sexual appeal, all descriptions of Betty Boop also included how childish she is in her appearance and in character. Barry Bogan stated, the cartoon of Betty Boop illustrates some human features that are sometimes labeled as neotenous, such as a large head and short arms and clumsy childlike movements. Betty Boop was described in a 1934 court case as combining in appearance the childish with the sophisticated, a large round baby face with big eyes and a nose like a button with a very small body of which perhaps the leading characteristic is the most self-confident little bust imaginable. I find this interesting because you can see many of these features that are attributed to Betty Boop actually reflected in our beauty standards today. Betty Boop was certainly given a girlish quality with her famous baby voice based on the baby singing of 
Baby Esther, a black singer from the 1920s. Betty Boop was drawn with a head more similar to a baby's than an adult's in proportion to her body. In many ways, Betty Boop set the precedent for the sexy baby trope thrusted upon grown women in cinema. To combine aspects of an innocent, wide-eyed baby with the sexual prowess and appeal of a grown woman. Part 2, Chapter 2, Marilyn Monroe My name is Lolita And, uh, I'm not supposed to Play With boys What? This song wasn't new However, this Lolita introduction was the song My Heart Belongs to Daddy was originally written for the 1938 musical Leave It to Me, where it was sung as a solo for Mary Martin in her Broadway debut. This new version for Monroe in the 1960s spoke to a new audience by acknowledging a polarizing cultural phenomenon, Lolita. Because everything seemingly relates back to Lolita. Marilyn Monroe rose to fame playing these bimbo-esque, dumb blonde characters. With her naive innocence, high-pitched, breathy voice, large eyes, button nose, and full figure. In many ways, Marilyn's on-screen persona became the blueprint for the sexy baby, and, as you may notice, bears some resemblance to Betty Boop. The mature woman's body with a doll-like face and a childlike persona. In most of Marilyn's films, she is dressed as an elegant adult woman though the infantilization comes once she opens her mouth. Many of Marilyn's characters were often depicted as dumb and childlike, possessing a childlike innocence that made her both sexually arousing and yet endearing to male audiences. I believe one of the main purposes of the childlike dumb persona is to make a man feel socially safe in the face of a woman he may otherwise feel threatened or intimidated by. In Some Like It Hot, Marilyn plays Sugar, the lead vocalist and ukulele player of an all-female band. Like many of Monroe's characters, Sugar is your typical dumb blonde. It would seem Sugar identifies with the dumb blonde trope advertising her dumbness throughout the film by repeatedly saying she is not very smart. I'm not very bright, I guess. I wouldn't say that. Careless, maybe. No, just dumb. If I had any brains, it wouldn't be on this crummy train with this crummy girl's band. The dumb blonde trope is further reflected in Sugar's habits for falling for the wrong man and in her tendency to be manipulated throughout the film. Though charming and charismatic, Sugar isn't the brightest and she isn't very experienced. Her sexual innocence translates to extreme sexual impact as her qualities render her the perfect physical manifestation of conventional male desire. Throughout the film, this instills the implication that brains are not as important as beauty. This dumb blonde role is a role Marilyn played many times throughout her career, including in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes and The Seven Year Itch. Though due to being typecast as a dumb blonde, she was often assumed to be a dumb blonde off the screen as well. Though many who knew Marilyn in real life have claimed this couldn't be further from the truth. This stems from the preconceived notion that women can't be beautiful and smart or they shouldn't be. This is intrinsically tied to the infantilization of women and the way in which archetypes and stereotypes of women on screen bleed into our perceptions of real life women off screen as well. Uh, you know, you have a reputation as uh, among the great mass of people, I think it's probably the most beautiful uh, blonde uh, in the world, but a kind of a dumb girl because you're a beautiful blonde and blondes and dumbness seem to go together. I think it all started with Maybe with gentlemen prefer blondes. You know, it's interesting um, that people associate, um, if you happen to have blonde hair, you know, naturally mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. not naturally, however, um, or if you're not out of shape in some way, mm -hmm. you're, you're absolutely dumb. I mean, you're considered dumb. I don't know why that is. It's very, I think it's a very limited view. It isn't true, so <laughs> I'm sure. Well, I mean, it doesn't matter what the person, mm -hmm. uh, what they look like, what color hair they have. Nonsense. Or if they uh, happen not to be out of shape. I mean, my time's to come. Gravity catches up with all of us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Part 2, Chapter 3, The Bimbo Redemption Arc. 
in the early 2000s, with the spike we saw in the use of the bimbo trope in film, we also saw a rise of what I'm kind of calling the bimbo redemption arc. The bimbo in film was often superficial and vapid, lacking any real character development as her sole purpose was either for men to look at and or was intended for comedic relief. Though thanks to the writing partners Kirsten Smith and Karen McCullough Lutz, we also were able to see the bimbo, the quote unquote bimbo in film, become more than just a pretty face. In The House Bunny and Legally Blonde, we have the opportunity to dive into the lives of two young women who from the outside, one may assume they are dumb and superficial. Though through these films, we have the unique opportunity of seeing the bimbo from the female gaze rather than the male gaze, thus humanizing her. The House Bunny is a 2008 comedy film directed by Fred Wolf and written by Kirsten Smith and Karen McCullough Lutz. I really enjoy this film because it is self-aware as it takes the bimbo trope and flips it on its head. The film follows Shelley, a Playboy bunny with dreams of becoming a playmate and being published as a centerfold in Playboy magazine. Though when she awakens in her bedroom in the Playboy mansion on her, 20th, on her 27th birthday, she is met with a note from Hugh Hefner kicking her out because she has gotten old. old. But I'm 27. But that's 59 in bunny years. Shelly is the epitome of the bimbo archetype. She is blonde, her skin is smooth and hairless, she adorns herself in various shades of girlish pinks, and she is aware of her sexuality and she navigates the world with this ditzy and childish excitement. Though because the film is written by two women, she is intended to be a satirical and self-aware portrayal of this archetype. Shelley is portrayed as a multifaceted character, and she rightfully should be, as she is still a human, not just an archetype. The film explores the expectation of women to be young, feminine, and sexy, though at the same time ditzy as not to be threatening to a male's ego. Shelley stumbles across a sorority house called Zeta Alpha Zeta. The members of the Zeta house are socially awkward, alternative, and dowdy. Their sorority is at threat of being shut down due to not receiving enough pledges. The sorority takes Shelley in to be their house mother in hopes that she can make them cool and attract boys, thus getting more pledges. And so she gives the girls makeovers. During her time spent with the Zetas, Shelley becomes attracted to an intellectual, altruistic guy named Oliver who works at a local retirement home. When she goes out on a date with Oliver, she is shocked when her usual ditzy and flirty tactics don't work on him. Money over here. Ah! And it's After this, Shelley receives a sort of make under in which she starts dressing more conservatively, wearing glasses, and attending classes in order to impress Oliver on their second date. The second date is also a failure as Shelley is trying too hard to be something that she isn't. The Zetas similarly don't feel as though their makeovers reflect who they are. Although they receive enough pledges to save their sorority, they don't like what they have become. They decide to give themselves a second makeover, this time being half Shelley, half themselves. In the end, both the Zetas and Shelley have been changed by each other's influence to not villainize traditional femininity, nor to villainize those who choose to not partake in traditional femininity. But I do know that one day, when your looks are gone, if everything you have is based on looks, well then you've got nothing. You need your friends and your family by your side to love you for who you are, not what you look like. At the Zeta House, our new motto is be who you are. Because we're a family, we're a family that loves you on the inside. This film is a refreshing commentary on the bimbo trope rather than a straight-faced use of it, allowing Shelley to develop into a fully realized and well-rounded character rather than just eye candy for the male gaze. Similarly to The House Bunny, a film famous for satirizing the bimbo trope and giving their lead a redemption arc is Legally Blonde, which is of no surprise as The House Bunny and Legally Blonde were written by the same women. Legally Blonde's lead, Elle Woods, has similar experiences to Shelley in which she goes on a journey of self-discovery and reflection, attempting to alter her feminine persona in order to be taken more seriously by her ex-boyfriend who broke up with her because he was attending Harvard and Elle wasn't serious enough for his aspirational goals of a politician. So you're breaking up with me because I'm too... blonde? Elle sets out to prove him wrong. 
From the outside, Elle is your stereotypical dumb blonde, and many underestimate her abilities because of the way she looks and presents herself. Though she manages to get into Harvard with great ease and thrives in the academic environment to the shock of those around her, especially her ex-boyfriend. About, uh, I, I'm sorry, are you here to see me? No, silly. I go here. You, you go where? Harvard. Law school. You got into Harvard Law? What, like it's hard? Ultimately, Elle stays true to her feminine ways and proves and showcases that beauty and brains can absolutely coexist. A woman can be both feminine and intelligent. In many ways, this arc parallels the real lives of Marilyn Monroe and Jane Mansfield, who were both actresses in the 1950s that were pigeonholed into dumb blonde roles. This translates to the way many perceived these two actresses off the screen. Many thought that Marilyn Monroe was as ditzy as her on-screen persona, though failed to recognize that she was actually an avid reader, and many have commented on her depth and intelligence. Likewise, Jane Mansfield had a reported IQ of 149, placing her on the top 0.1% of the population. Legally Blonde and The House Bunny have both offered redemption stories for the bimbo archetype. Often used for comedic relief or to be ogled at by the male viewers, these two films offered a new perspective to the bimbo trope, proving that women who subscribe to an ultra-feminine lifestyle and aesthetic can be multifaceted people with depth and intelligence, which prior to these films wasn't a perspective that was offered. Thus, these characters are freed from the infantilizing male gaze. Because these characters are written by women for women, they don't need to worry about male audiences finding characters like Elle Woods threatening due to her possession of conventionally attractive beauty whilst being extremely smart and charismatic. Because as we discussed, the bimbo archetype was created in order to blend the simultaneous sexualization and infantilization of women to appeal to a sort of pedophilic, fragile male gaze. In many ways, the bimbo was created to be objectified. And by crafting characters such as Elle Woods, who are intelligent as well as hyper-feminine, the illusion is popped. I object. And we realize what these hyper-feminine, quote-unquote, bimbos have been all along. Humans. Tavisha Stood further explores the correlation between the infantilization of women and the sexualization of girlhood in their essay, The Infantilization of Women in Mainstream Media and Society. But it isn't just the infantilization of womanhood that is problematic. It is also the sexualization of girlhood that adds to the growing problem. In a fashion spread titled Lolita is a Comeback Kid in the New York Times Magazine, women were dressed up in a baby doll style with the extremely small dresses and hair arranged in bows and barrettes. The sexualization of girlhood, while womanhood is simultaneously deemed undesirable, shows how society's perception of femininity and women is starting to be indissolubly linked to infantilization. So what are the effects of this? Lazarfeld and Merton have argued how the media can have a narcotizing effect on individuals who then become victims of false wants. Thinking logically when young girls are constantly sexualized and women are infantilized, this portrayal of women will naturally create a false perception of how youth and submissiveness are traits to look for in a sex partner. It invites men to start viewing young girls to be sexually desirable and sexually available. We know this to be true due to media priming where an individual, when exposed repeatedly to a particular idea, is conditioned to make decisions they would not normally make. In a study by Sharon Lamb titled Sexualized Innocence Effects of Magazine Ads Portraying Adult Women as Sexy Little Girls, she argues how this constant sexualization of girlhood consequently leads to the viewers to be desensitized to the victimization of girls. We further see this infantilization reflected in our beauty standards. As women desperately find refuge in the offices of plastic surgeons, seeking sanctuary from, from the ever-creeping claws of aging and time, there has been a huge surge in recent years of women getting Botox and other anti-aging procedures as early as their 20s or even their teens. The fact that women must worry about aging before all their teeth have even grown in is dystopian at best. In addition, we see this reflected in the widely influenced expectation for women to be completely hairless on their body at all times. 
To quote Tavisha Sid again, a woman's physique in this day and age is steeped in the infantilization of femininity, with one of the seminal examples being that of the adornment of a hairless body. The association of femininity with docility and dependence relays the infantilization of women, and the hair removal plays on this concept of women as childish and or immature. The idea of a hairless body being feminine is inherently infantilizing since it imitates the body of a prepubescent girl and directly ties femininity to physical appearance. Body hair is a marker that polices the very difference between a woman and a girl, much like periods would. Whether it's the hair grown in your underarms or your pubic area or even your face, it is one of the main body markers which highlight your transition into womanhood. Therefore, when society makes this same body marker ugly or anti-feminine, it automatically marks womanhood as ugly. It rejects womanhood and embraces girlhood. It reiterates the message of how women who radiate and imitate the body of a prepubescent child is one that is feminine and acceptable and those that show signs of aging are simply undesirable. Part three, the born sexy yesterday in film and the simultaneous infantilization, sexualization, and objectification of women and girls. I remember last year I was watching a, a bunch of science fiction movies and I kept noticing both a tendency to pair women in their early 20s with men in their 40s as romantic interests and additionally the tendency for aliens and robots who were incredibly infantilized to be paired with grown men. I remember feeling very uncomfortable by this and it felt sort of pedophilic to me. I expressed this to my partner and a few other people in my life and they agreed, though it wasn't until I stumbled upon this video where I heard someone else speak about this uncomfortable phenomenon within science fiction and fantasy. Born Sexy Yesterday is a term coined by Jonathan McIntosh from Pop Culture Detective here on YouTube. They have an incredible video essay going more in depth into this trope, which I will have linked below for further viewing. The term Born Sexy Yesterday is derived from the idiom born yesterday, meaning extremely naive, inexperienced, or ignorant. You may have used this term or heard it used in the phrase, you must think I was born yesterday, in response to someone saying something foolish or attempting to lie or trick you. Born sexy yesterday highlights a trope within science fiction and fantasy um, in which a very attractive woman, usually some sort of fantasy creature such as a robot or an alien, is extremely naive due to an unfamiliar environment or in the case of Lilu from Fifth Element was quite literally born yesterday and therefore possess a childlike naivety despite their fully developed female figure. Part 3, Chapter 1, Fifth Element. I still remember watching Fifth Element for the first time last year and and although I enjoyed the film, and the character Lilu, I couldn't help but feel slightly uncomfortable with the with the way her character was so infantilized, especially since the age difference between the two lead actors was already a little bit jarring and something that made me feel uncomfortable. 42-year-old Bruce Willis stars as the film's protagonist Corbin and stars opposite Mila Jovovich as Lilu, who was only 22 years old at the time. If you haven't seen the film, Lilu is one of the supreme beings of the universe. She was sent to Earth in corporeal form to become what is known as the fifth element, the final piece of a powerful weapon to destroy the great evil. The fifth element is a human-like being designed to be perfect. Through access to isolated DNA, Lilu is constructed by an advanced machine part by part, beginning with her skeleton, followed by muscles and organs and so on, until she is revealed to be a beautiful young woman, thus literally being born sexy yesterday. Though, because Lilu is quite literally born right in front of us, she is naive to the world around her. She doesn't speak English, instead she speaks in a high-pitched voice in an unfamiliar language that sounds extremely reminiscent of the ramblings of a toddler. Hi. You okay? Don't 
dopo mette in bacca se non vuoi ti tu male ne palela se no chi come sto tu un trum trum sono i doppi da dindo scala nella dindo il gela boom boom yeah i understand boom bada boom big big bada boom big bada big boom Big yeah. boom. Yeah, big boom. bada boom. Bada boom. <laughs> big ba boom. Big bada boom. Mm. And like a toddler, the people around her find this rambling, endearing, and cute. She is also naive to the world around her. Once again, much like a toddler, she is curious and explores her environments with an infantilized naivety. And yet, despite her jarringly childish mannerisms and speech, she is repeatedly sexualized and sought after by the men around her, creating a uncomfortable dichotomy of the simultaneous sexualization and infantilization. Part 3, Chapter 2, Tron Legacy This is similar to Korra in Tron Legacy. The character of Korra is an isomorphic algorithm, or ISO. Basically, she is a sentient computer program in the shape of a woman. She's the miracle, man. Everything I ever worked for. A digital frontier to reshape the human condition. As the last of the ISOs, Korra is described this way. Profoundly naive. Unimaginably wise. If that sounds vaguely like something someone might say about a child, it's no accident. Because that's exactly how Tron Legacy portrays Korra. But between you and me, Jules Verne is my favorite. <laughs> Do you know Jules Verne? Sure. What's he like? She has the mind of a naive, yet highly skilled child, but in the body of a mature, sexualized woman. She also serves as our hero's love interest. Profoundly naive and yet unimaginably wise captures the essence of this trope. And once again, Quora is in the body of an attractive 20-year-old, though possesses the mannerisms and speech patterns of an innocent child. Part 3, Chapter 3, Chobits. Chobits is another piece of media that falls into the born sexy yesterday trope, in fact, this trope is rampant across anime in general. Chobits is a science fiction manga that was later adapted into an anime in 2002. The series tells the story of a college student, Hideki Marusua, as he discovers an abandoned Persicom in the trash. A Persicom is a personal computer in the shape of a human. Hideki names his Persicom Chi, as this is the only word she is able to speak at the beginning. Uh, she, uh, huh? Chi? Chi, what's that? Oh, I get it. Is that your name? From the beginning, the series has a blend of infantilizing, sexualizing, and objectifying Chi. When Hideki first finds Chi in the trash, he carries her back to his apartment and struggles to figure out how to turn the Persicom on. Through a series of trial and error, Hideki finds out how to turn Chi on by touching her groin area. It can't be. No, not there. Impossible, how can that possibly be the switch? But that's really the only place I haven't tried yet. I'm not doing this because I'm perverted or anything, but What's the point of having it, if it doesn't work? Yeah, that's right. Right.
This is obviously a tongue-in-cheek play on words. He turns the Persicom on by, well, turning her on. Upon being turned on, she immediately regards Hideki with adoration and attention. Like Korra and Lilu, Chi has a very childish personality. She is naive, innocent, and curious. She also speaks with a girlish, high-pitched voice. Chi! Hey, are you really that happy? Take care of yourself. <laughs> no, Chi, that's not what you're supposed to say now. That's what you say when someone's leaving. At times like this, you're supposed to say welcome home. You say welcome... Welcome home. Well, welcome home. I would say that unlike Lilu and Korra, though, she is depicted as physically looking rather young as well, looking to be around 15 years old. Though she is a robot and therefore technically ageless, right? <laughs> Hideki begins to fall in love with Chi and the series questions the ethics and validity of the relationship between humans and robots, as a lot of these movies do. Uh, <laughs> Pervert? Hideki is a pervert! Pervert! Hideki is a pervert! Part 3, Chapter 4, The Blade Runner series. Both of the Blade Runner films, in my opinion, uh, have an issue with both their representation of women and their, represent and their representation of BIPOC, or rather the lack thereof. Notably, between Blade Runner and Blade Runner 2049, there is exactly one female character with dialogue who is an actual human being and not a robot or an AI. <laughs> Fei Wang states in her essay, Gender and Race Issues in Blade Runner, the problem with making almost all female characters replicants is that the theme of this movie is about the humanity of replicants, and the movie never really gives you an answer about it. It is kind of the point of the movie. I got it. But when you make nearly every female character a robot with questionable humanity, the movie is basically treating women as subhuman. I don't want to spend too much time on Blade Runner because I do think the issues with Blade Runner has more to do with the sexualization and, and objectification of women rather than the direct infantilization of women. Though I do think it is important to bring up as screenwriter Hampton Fancher, the man who married Sue Leon, the first Lolita, when he was 25 and she was 17, wrote both Blade Runner and Blade Runner 2049. And I do believe that the appeal of fembots does correlate with the appeal of the infantilized woman slash the Lolita trope. In her essay, The Dubious Portrayal of Women in Blade Runner 2049, Jessica Wilkinson cr critiques the character Joy. Joy is an AI, a hologram made for the pleasure of the consumer, who in this case is Kay. In this way, she is a literal commodification. Joy is his perfectly designed girlfriend. She is able to change her outfit at will to suit him, and she can appear and disappear as he sees fit. When he wants her, he can summon her with his device. She has no external purpose, and she is killed as another female character stomps on the very device Kay stores her consciousness, and her last words are, I love you. Her life revolves around Kay, even at the point of death. Women are depicted no better in the original Blade Runner. In the original Blade Runner, there is this extremely disturbing uh, scene between Rachel, a replicant, and the protagonist, Rick Deckard, in which Deckard sexually assaults Rachel. Deckard makes repeated sexual advances at Rachel in spite of her giving him multiple verbal and physical cues that she is not interested in his advances and would like to leave. Deckard traps her in the room with him and forces himself onto her. It is an extremely uncomfortable moment and yet is framed as romantic and lustful. Jonathan McIntosh from Pop Culture Detective also has a video going more in depth into this specific scene and other scenes like this in cinemas. That's, I'll have that video linked down below as well. Here's where it crosses the line into sexual assault. Deckard responds to rejection by getting angry and turning violent. He punches the door closed, grabs her, shoves her against the window, pins her there, and then forces a kiss on her 
as tender music starts playing to indicate to the audience that we are now supposed to find all of this seductive. The implicit threat of violence weighs on everything in this scene. Will you kiss me? The scene includes many of the same dangerous messages we saw in previous examples. Again, we see the myth that women secretly want it, and again, the myth that women will respond positively to male aggression. I remember feeling so uncomfortable when I watched this for the first time and disturbed. What we see in these examples is the display of ownership over these women. And what this has to do with the Lolita trope, for example, is what makes the Lolita trope appealing to men in the first place. Youthfulness indicates naivety. Many men prey after young women and girls because they know young girls, especially minors, will be more easily manipulated in doing what they want. A grown man making sexual advances towards a girl significantly younger than himself displays an unbalanced and unethical power dynamic in which the man has significantly more control in the relationship than the woman or girl. This is why joy is so appealing to consumers. And this is why Deckard felt entitled to Raquel, because she is a replicant, not a human. In addition, an AI like Joy provides these men with another thing that is sought after in the Lolita trope, the appearance of youth. Though unlike Dolores Hayes, Joy will never age. Unlike Leonardo DiCaprio, who must dispose of his girlfriends after they turn 25 and seek out a new younger girlfriend, Joy will remain youthful and loyal forever. As you can see, the born sexy yesterday trope in many ways combines attributes of both the Lolita and the bimbo to create the perfect sci-fi fantasy through the lens of the male gaze. As stated, this trope not only infantilizes and sexualizes women and girls as the earlier tropes do, but also objectifies them in the process, as women's roles become interchangeable with robots and AI. Robots like Chi offer the ultimate male fantasy. She is naive, but obedient. She is innocent, yet curious. She is sexually appealing while looking and remaining youthful forever. Someone like Chi from Chobits or Joy from Blade Runner 2049 will never fall victim to the perils of aging. Their bodies will forever remain youthful in appearance and their personality will never falter as they have been programmed to be childish and innocent yet sexually appealing. The frontal cortex of their brain is not going to be fully grown by the time they turn 25 because it doesn't exist. Born Sexy Yesterday is about an unbalanced relationship, but it's also very much connected to masculinity. The subtext of the trope is rooted in a deep-seated male insecurity around sex and sexuality. The crux of the trope is a fixation on male superiority, a fixation with holding power over an innocent girl. But in order to make that socially acceptable, science fiction is employed to put the mind of that girl into a sexualized adult woman's body. It's a fantasy based on fear, fear of women who are men's equal in sexual experience and romantic history and fear of losing the intellectual upper hand to women. Jonathan McIntosh also rightfully points out that the born sexy yesterday trope also has the roots in the white supremacist colonization of indigenous and black communities globally. The idea of the naive, exotic woman who is interested in you as a civilized white man is a concept that is prevalent in the media that falsely romanticizes this colonization. This trope is intrinsically tied to the sexualization and fetishization of black and indigenous women and femmes. Born Sexy Yesterday is the ultimate male fantasy. Much like the manic pixie dream girl, she is an extraordinary woman who finds the most average of men fascinating. And thus the average male viewer can watch these average men find love with this extraordinary woman and find solace and comfort in this sexual fantasy. In addition, many of the characters that fall into this category are virgins by nature of being so young and inexperienced with the world. Jonathan McIntosh explores this in his essay. As such, the trope rests on some troubling patriarchal ideas about female purity and virginity. By definition, characters born sexy yesterday 
have no past lovers and no previous sexual experiences. She is framed as pure and innocent sexually and romantically, unchanged and uncorrupted by the attention of other men. In this way, the born sexy yesterday parallels the Lolita, naive, innocent, and untouched. Born sexy yesterday is a child wrapped in the body of a young adult woman. To make the pedophilic appeal of her childishness and purity more palatable to audiences. So, what do these three tropes have in common? They all combine childish innocence, virginal purity, and yet possess the sexual prowess of grown women. In my opinion, these are all extremely similar tropes in different packages. These three tropes are all examples of the way we see the sexy baby portrayed and normalized within cinema and thus our culture. This trope not only contributes to the way in which minors are sexualized and preyed upon in our society, but the normalization of the sexualization of minors and the infantilization of women contributes to women feeling as though they are running out of time as early as our teens. I have journal entries from as early as 17 years old feeling like, I'm getting too old. Being told as women that our sexual appeal begins to expire after the age of 18 is damaging and predatory. It is predatory and problematic to prey on women as close to childhood as legally possible. And this is exactly what these tropes were created for. For grown men to get as close to children as legally possible. To quote Mia Mercedo in their essay, I can't shut up about sexy babies. Women have long been told that the only thing better than being beautiful is not knowing you're beautiful. Look mature and act innocent. Be helpless and f***able. We treat Leonardo DiCaprio's dating history like an anomaly, despite it following a trend among men who date women. While straight women self-report being most attracted to men their age, straight men of all ages say they're most attracted to women in their 20s. Likewise, a 2018 study among predominantly white straight men and women found that men's desirability peaked at age 50, women's peaked at 18. Of course, none of this is new. After all, a sexy baby never ages. You may have noticed that not only do all of these tropes have an emphasis on youth, but they also have an overwhelming emphasis on whiteness. As the film industry has been not only controlled by and created for the eyes of men, it is specifically catering to the gaze of cis straight white men. These tropes not only uphold a standard of pedophilic gaze, but also hold a standard of white supremacist gaze, as they feed into the racist archetype of purity and innocence. This hypersexualization of young girls still impacts BIPOC communities greatly, but the consequences experienced by BIPOC BIPOC women and those who have been socialized as women by these tropes can be felt differently. I would like to direct you to this video by Khadija, which I will have linked below, as Khadija explores the way in which the male gaze and the male gaze through a cinematic lens specifically impacts BIPOC communities and even specifically women or those who are not women but have been socialized as women. In addition, I want to make it clear that just because I have mentioned a piece of media, person, or character in this video does not mean I think said media, person, or character is inherently bad, nor does it mean that I dislike said media, person, or character. In fact, quite the contrary. Much of the content and people I have discussed today I am actually a fan of. I am honestly a fan of Fifth Element. I enjoy Betty Boop, and I think Euphoria excels in many ways, to mention a few. But it is because I enjoy some of this media that I feel the need to discuss it. I think we too often operate in binaries of love or hate, especially in the age of online discourse, though I believe there is room for a gray area. You can enjoy a piece of media while remaining critical of it. You can acknowledge the faults of some media while praising additional elements. My goal with this essay was to acknowledge the tropes and media that contribute to a narrative that I believe to be harmful and have real life negative repercussions. 
I am positive not all of the directors or writers of the cinema I have discussed today have malintent in contributing to this fetishistic, infantilizing narrative, but that's why it's important to have dialogue about the media in which we consume, especially when a large percentage of cinema has been told only from the perspective of a certain demographic for a certain demographic. We begin to normalize tropes and behavior on screen that can be harmful, and in turn, we begin to normalize this behavior off screen as well. Cinema can be a powerful tool, and to wield it is a responsibility.